Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need, for these high purposes do we unite in worship. Again, my friends, a good good morning to everyone. We're in High Holy Days, which began last Sunday with Rosh Hashanah and continues through October 4th with Yom Kippur. Listen to this reading by Michael Lerner. Built into High Holy Days is a deep psychological wisdom that can and should be reclaimed. In the 10 days of repentance that extend from the first day of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, through the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, we may engage in mass psychological process as we participate in individual and collective reassessment of our lives. This involves three steps. Step one, remembering. Looking at what we have done and what we have become in the past year. Rosh Hashanah is called the Day of Remembrance. Step two, measuring. Measuring what we have done and what we have become against our own highest vision of who we are and who we could be. We can do this both individually and collectively. Step three, repentance. This does not mean merely a recommitment to good values that are so abstract that they function only to make us feel good. Real repentance means determining exactly what we are going to do differently in our lives. This is not a series of New Year's resolutions, but a serious plan of action based on the deepest self-scrutiny. The 10 days of repentance are intended to provide deep, concentrated attention to change. Self-scrutiny not only for individuals, the religious community as a whole needs to engage in forgiveness. Has the community really embodied its highest values? Has it really been sensitive to pains of members and to pain and suffering that it continues to inflict in the world? Has the community used its faith merely as a way to feel good or has it been engaged in the nuts and bolts of social and political action to transform the world? Are nice sentiments matched with serious actions? Some consideration of this time of repentance by Michael Lerner. Some of you may know about the story, The Sunflower, by Simon Weisenthal. Anybody, anybody read The Sunflower? Simon was a Jew, imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp in the 1940s. One day, he was pulled from his work detail to the bedside of a young SS officer who was dying. The young man had committed two heinous crimes, the SS officer, and on his deathbed, he wanted to confess and receive, receive absolution from a Jew. Simon was dumbfounded. He listened to the soldier's story, but he left the bedside without saying or doing anything. The soldier seeking forgiveness was complicated, and so was Simon's reaction to the request. Nagging questions swirled around Simon's head for years after being released from the camp. Later, he wrote a book about this experience. The Sunflower attracted such attention that it generated many seminars and symposia on the question. Simon asked at the end of the book, what would you have done? That is, would you have absolved the soldier? The array of respondents, the theologians, the politicians, activists, psychiatrists, and many others have demonstrated how complicated this question of forgiveness really is. Simon's story also reminds us that this stuff of being human is not easy. Anybody ever notice? 
We humans are constantly making choices based on previous life experiences and on moral values and principles. Even if made with great intentionality, sometimes our decisions are not the best. There's no human alive who has not made a mistake or might have chosen a better path. The young soldier acknowledged his mistakes. Simon also was left wondering if he too had made a mistake in not offering absolution and forgiveness. Another powerful presentation of forgiveness, which I can recommend to you, there's a video, it's been out for about 10 years now, called The Power of Forgiveness. And it has several vignettes in it, several case studies, including one about a shooting at an Amish school in central Pennsylvania, where I served previously. An, a, a powerful story of how the Amish offered forgiveness to the shooter in that school. Hurts we do others can alter lives, and so can forgiveness we offer. Mother Teresa told a story about how her sister of charity saved the life of a woman abandoned in an alleyway in Calcutta. The woman literally had been thrown there by her son. Once she was strong enough to talk, she begged the sisters to find the son. She said that when he was young, she shut him out of her house. He never forgave her. He held a grudge that spiraled his life downward and downward and downward. At his mother's bedside, the son accepted the mother's request for forgiveness. The mother did the same for the son. Then the mother died peacefully. I like Lou Smead's definition of forgiveness. If you don't go away with anything else today, take this definition. To forgive is to surrender the right to get even. To forgive is to surrender the right to get even. Forgiving is not forgetting or just tolerating or excusing. Forgiving is a turning from hurtful actions so they don't dominate our lives. Forgiveness is letting go of resentment and that vision of self as victim, poor me. Forgiveness is turning, but not forgetting or denying. So wrongs of the past don't dominate the present and the future in ways we may not even remotely be aware of. Forgiveness helps us maintain relationships with ourselves and with others. We forgive ourselves and each other in the litany, right? Forgiveness is also literally good for your health. Subjects who avoid forgiveness have higher blood pressure, did you know that? Than subjects who have forgiven those who have wronged them. Even though Oscar Wilde cynically said, always forgive your enemies, nothing else annoys them so much. <laughs> to know forgiveness really does make us more complete human beings. Forgiveness is both delicate and powerful. A few years ago, I took an online course for ministers on forgiveness. As part of classwork, I had to work through an actual event in my life which could benefit from forgiveness. Now, we ministers, we know this stuff of spiritual exploration. This would be easy, I thought, a piece of cake. I picked a personal situation that I had never reached closure on. But I knew I could nail this quickly, right? Because we ministers know how to do this. <laughs> it was astounding how many layers I opened and peeled away in order to reach that core, unresolved situation requiring forgiveness. Yes, hard work requiring patience. Yes, rewards for my soul that I can't even put into words. Autumn is a time for turning. The trees are turning. Temperatures are dropping. The bears are coming down from the mountains. I can attest to that. They've been here. High Holy Days, framed by Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, are on the calendar. 
Turning is also occurring in this congregation. I know everyone has felt the turning, a return to the fall schedule, a tra transition to some new staff members, the beginning of interim ministry. Inspired by our Judeo-Christian heritage, autumn is a natural fit, a good time for Unitarian Universalists to examine forgiveness. It's complicated, isn't it? We heard that in the story of the sunflower. Forgiveness goes two ways as well. We ask for forgiveness of a wrong we have done, and we accept the admission of wrongdoing from others. Two way, two way. Sometimes the toughest forgiveness is within ourselves. I won't ask for a show of hands, but anybody have those darn old Puritan standards within? where you have lots to feel guilty about. To echo Rabbi Harold Kushner, we may wonder how good we have to be. Alas, unresolved guilt about our own shortcomings, whether or not based in reality, may keep us from turning and going forward in forgiveness with others in ways we may not even remotely be aware of. It can be challenging to break open unconscious secrets and name what it is that keeps us from moving forward to healthy relationships. Not finding reconciliation can put heavy burdens on our backs. There's a story that takes place in Grudgeville. I don't know what state Grudgeville is in. Maybe it's Colorado, I don't know. Where citizens are all bent over from carrying grudges and secrets. Once they learned five important words. I'm sorry, I forgive you. The bundles came off their backs. The people stood up straight. They saw for the first time the trees in many years. They saw humanity in one another's faces. I suspect they may also have seen divinity in those faces. Forgiveness and healing, it can change lives. It can invite us to stand up straight. The people of South Africa knew this well. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, there is no future without forgiveness. And think about Tutu. After being released from 27 years in prison, Nelson Mandela lived out that message of no, for, no future without forgiveness. Mandela said he wanted to go forward openly and honestly. Most religions in the world include forgiveness in their theological and ethical systems. Religious practices call individuals, groups, and even sometimes entire nations to forgiveness. For example, forgiveness was central in defining our ancestor denomination, universalism. In 1803, Hosea Ballou, Hosea Ballou, B-A-L-L-O-U, keep that name in mind, you're going to hear me reference Ballou many times in the coming year. In 1803, Hosea Ballou, a homespun preacher from southern New Hampshire, published his treatise on atonement. This became the defining, the, the defining theology for universalism. As the new country sought identity after the American Revolution, universalism was a radical way of religion, a new way of religion. It had immense appeal in this young country fresh off from rebelling against England. It's said that universalism may have been the fifth or sixth most populous religion for a time in the 19th century. Our ancestors, our ancestors, we were dominant in numbers in early 19th century religion. Up until then, most American practice was Calvinist, based on humans being born into original sin. You know, some people would find salvation and others wouldn't, and some of us were chosen and others weren't. Universalists believe that humans are inherently good and all are chosen. 
and were sinful only through deeds, not through inherency. Therefore, at death, all persons find atonement. They will find atonement or at one atonement with one another and with a source of life which many called God. In the 19th century, universalism was amazingly appealing. These days, Unitarian Universalists might engage in more talk about sin and salvation. When we do discuss sin, we think of it not so much as original sin, because that's a Calvinist concept, but we think of sin as actions which pull us away from our authentic self. I fully believe that modern liberal religion would benefit from some type of regular practice or ritual that helps us work through sin as we are all capable of doing. I'm not advocating weekly confession of sins that I knew in Orthodox religion, not at all. But I do think there is something to a habit of remembering that it is human to make mistakes and to seek and accept forgiveness. I'm sorry and I forgive you are very important words. As Michael Lerner wrote about High Holy Days, Jews have three concrete steps for reconciliation. First, remembering our shortcomings to realistically assess how we have fallen short. Second, to measure our shortcomings, not beating ourselves up, but being clear about our shortcomings. The first principle of UUism promotes the inherent worth and dignity of all persons. This helps make this measuring easier. The first principle reminds us that we are fundamentally good, that it is actions, not inherency, in which we've fallen short. Third, engaging in forgiveness and repentance. Twelve-step programs refer to this as making amends. Repentance. It's the inverse of forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness. We offer repentance. Remembering, measuring, forgiving. Three steps. This approach of High Holy Days works because it is deep and intentional. I have a friend named Lisa, a birthright Unitarian Universalist. She told me about when she was on a driving trip with a Jewish friend. They were together long enough in a car that small tensions arose, you know, when you're in a confined space with another person. But their friendship remained strong. During the next high holy days after the trip, her friend came to Lisa and apologized for any of her actions from the past year that might have caused Lisa pain. Lisa casually accepted the apology. She responded like another woman I once met whose family avoided deep emotions. Anybody relate to that? (laughs) This woman, this other woman, learned what she called making nice nice. That is quickly smoothing over pain or emotion so as to not rock the family boat. So my friend Lisa made nice nice in response to her friend's apology. And then just as casually said back, yeah, she was sorry too for any pain that she may have caused. However, her friend did not accept Lisa's apology, not right away. As a good student of high holy days, the friend took forgiveness seriously. She wanted to really internalize the apology. Lisa came to understand that for her friend, forgiveness really meant something. Taken seriously, forgiveness became a deep, transformative process beyond mere words. Forgiveness led to actions and new ways of living. While Lerner and others lay out a method for forgiveness in three, easy step, three steps, we know that forgiveness and healing is not nearly as easy as one, two, three. It takes courage, doesn't it? Our theme in October, our worship theme, 
It takes courage to f and it, because we may feel risky and vulnerable. The, beautiful, the beauty in forgiveness is that in taking risks, we can rid ourselves of those bundles on our backs, helping resolve things in life that aren't working as they might. Deep forgiveness can clear away wrongs that may have accumulated. In breaking chains of hurt, deep work can lead to peace and justice and truly can transform the world. Think of the power in forgiveness. We come to church for many reasons, including the community of being with others. The liberal religious community can help this hard work of forgiveness and healing. Just think of how much you as a community could accomplish in 10 days of assessing relationships with yourselves and with others. Engaging in forgiveness with your community at your side, supporting you and loving you. And those 10 days don't need to be just right now. They can be any time in the calendar. Taking forgiveness then a step beyond the personal, any faith community as a whole can engage in, tur in turning and healing. Autumn is an excellent time. Consider how you individually or as part of this community can turn. How can you remember events of the past, confront your hurts, and make amends? 10 days of repenting in Jewish practice might seem long, but if this period can be a turning point, isn't that time worth it, my friends? Forgiveness, it's a profound spiritual practice in personal and congregational life and in our world that right now so desperately needs the peace that can come from forgiveness. My friends, may this time of turning on so many levels inspire us to examine the role of forgiveness and healing May we remember how turning can move us from callousness to sensitivity, hostility to love, pettiness to purpose, envy to contentment, carelessness to discipline, faith from fear to faith. May we remember that turning can move us toward more authentic relationships with love, with life, and with one another. May all this be so.